Okay, uh, welcome everybody. According to my watch, it's a little bit past one, so hopefully everybody who was intending to get here got here. Uh, welcome again to everybody. Um, and I will continue on from lecture one uh, today with lecture two. Before I do that, there were a few questions uh, that I think I resolved many of them with people individually about lecture one. Um, and I see somebody here has given me a question on a piece of paper, which is fine. And the question is, why is the, <coughs> this, uh, the Big Bang pictured as a bell or tuba shape, a trumpet? Why not a sphere, equal expansion in all directions? Um, I'm not a cosmologist, but I, my understanding is that the, you can picture the, our universe as relatively flat. So when we saw that Big Bang come out and it expanded out this way, that, that the idea is that you could slice at any time of that universe expansion. And it would be um, a little bit like our galaxy, more two-dimensional than three-dimensional. That's my understanding. Um, the, the other question that someone asked was a little bit more about, they wanted to know a definition of life. <laughs> That's a very difficult uh, thing to answer, and I guess I would just say that in our case, life on Earth would be defined by or entities that contain RNA and or DNA. Um, and all of those forms are self-replicating, they metabolize, and they reproduce. But actually, you can read, well, maybe even books about the definition of life. It's not an easy thing to define. Um, but that's how, at least I think of it, in terms of life on Earth. There could be other types of life out there in the universe that are quite distinct from ours. Um, we don't know about those, of course. And nobody's ever made uh, those here on Earth. So uh, that was the, um, the other question. and. Uh, I think that was it. Does anybody else want to ask a question before I start in on um, lecture two? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oxygen. Several people had uh, questions about oxygen. And I should just say, because I didn't have that much time, I explained it in the book uh, in chapters um, one and a little bit in two. This notion of oxygen, you know, it, we live in an unusual planet in the sense that there's 21% by volume oxygen in the air, which is very good for us in terms of our metabolism and for all animals. And what I said yesterday was that one of the ideas as to why there was this delay in terms of this explosion of animals that happened in the Cambrian was because oxygen levels had to get to a certain threshold, around 2%, before animals could be a viable uh, way of of living, because you have to, when you have an animal, you have a volume, you have to be able to get the oxygen into that volume and you have to be able to distribute it. And to do that, you need a fairly high concentration of the atmosphere. Now, why did it take so long for oxygen to get high at high levels was twofold. One is oxygen is produced primarily through photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the reaction by which plants grow using sunlight as a form of energy, combining water with CO2 to make their organic substrate, and in the process, give off free oxygen gas, O2. Now, the problem about that is that there were lots of elements on Earth, primarily iron in the ocean, that were in a reduced chemical state. In other words, they were existing on an Earth with no free oxygen. And when that free oxygen came available, they reacted with it very quickly to form essentially rust, iron oxides. So there was a huge amount of iron that had to first be re removed from the oceans uh, before oxygen could actually start to increase in the atmosphere without being removed. Um, so, and those very large iron oxide deposits we know of in South Africa as uh, banded iron formations, and they exist in Canada and Australia as well, and that's where we get all of our iron to form steel. So Sishin and uh, Columella, uh, Kumba iron ore, they're all mining those big deposits up country. Uh, those are all billion year old, two, three billion year old deposits of that iron that was extracted with the uh, advent of life photosynthesizing that oxygen removing it. So that's a quick explanation of oxygen. Hope that's clear. <coughs> 
Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a very good question, um, and what I would say for that is um, that science can't answer that question because science depends on being able to observe or measure things. And everything we can see and measure around us, as far as we can see with telescopes, everything that we can see and measure appears to be from that initial Big Bang. In other words, we don't appear to be able to see any further back than that initial stage of the Big Bang. Maybe someday someone will figure out a way to see further back than that, but to my knowledge, no one has as yet. So it's all rather unclear exactly what was happening before the Big Bang. So for us, from our perspective of rel you know, relative time, starts with the Big Bang. And before that, it's just an unknown. So, any other questions? Yeah, one more. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry, I just couldn't quite hear that. Quite? Can you just? Uh, okay. Yeah. How did, how did life become so diverse? <laughs> OK. Um, what I would say about that is that the diversity of life is reflective of the modifications of that very earliest organism that we call LUCA, the last universal common ancestor would have had a form of DNA. And that DNA has been modified through time. And modifications of the DNA have led to a whole variety of different life forms. And that's one of the beauties of that molecule that resides all the information for how to make you or me or, or flies or insects, whatever, is in that DNA. And that DNA, as it gets modified, can then produce variations on life forms that are existing. So through time, that DNA, through modifications of it, have given rise to all these different organisms. So that's, that's a quick answer. <laughs> OK, so I think we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the um, second lecture. And I just have a little recap here, just to remind you from yesterday the idea was that if the advantage to big history, to going really far back, as far as we can to the Big Bang, is that um, the lesson it teaches us is that as different as all life forms appear to us, in fact, they're much the same. And that is reflecting the fact that we all share this common ancestor. There may have been other life forms at the beginning. But what we, we don't know about them. They could have conceivably existed, but they weren't successful. The one that was successful is our last universal common ancestor on the basis of DNA, and that's the one that's carried on from that time. And that's the real uh, lesson from big history that I think is really important, and that our relatively late arrival was in part because it depended on the very long amount of time taken for those various life forms to evolve and for complexity to evolve, okay? So the idea around evolution is you have to evolve from something that already exists. And then that something that becomes newly formed can be done through modification of what already exists. <coughs> and through very complex process and over quite a long period of time often, you can take a cell that's light sensitive and eventually evolve it into something as complex as a human eye. So that's the idea that this long period of time is perhaps re re necessary to evolve complexity. And I wanted to take you through that deep time because it's, I think, important in putting it in perspective to the section of time I now want to talk about, which is really much shorter, 
instead of 13.8 billion years, we're going to talk about the last six or so, seven million years. And that's relevant to us because in our eight family tree, uh, and by the way, that's Charles Darwin. I forgot to mention him yesterday. <laughs> Charles Darwin, as I think many, well, probably all of you know, uh, is the, the man who very uh, cleverly came up with the process of natural selection to explain how life forms, all these different amazing life forms can evolve through time. Uh, that's him as a young man. Um, and this segment of time represents that of our lineage. Okay, So we descended from the great ape, or we are a great ape, actually. Uh, we're quite a different looking great ape, but in many respects, we have many similarities. And as I mentioned, we're genetically most similar to the chimpanzee. Um, and the point being that we evolved from a common ancestor with chimpanzees about six, seven million years ago. We didn't actually evolve from chimpanzees, but we share a common ancestor with them from about six or seven million years ago. What did that ancestor look like? We don't know. There's no fossils of it yet. But it probably was more like a chimpanzee than us, one assumes, because the environment in which it lived was more similar to where chimpanzees live today than where we live today. The chimpanzees, of course, continued to evolve after the split with us, and they also uh, diverged into two groups, the bonobos and the chimpanzees. So each one of these has their own lineage. You could follow that for gorillas, for orangutans, for any of these. Now, that won't be the focus here. We'll focus on a humans. And we actually know quite a bit about that human lineage because it's been of a lot of interest and people have studied it a lot. So that's the topic I want to talk about in this lecture is how humans emerged. And the focus will be on how we emerged out of an unsettled world. What do I mean by the word unsettled? I mostly mean it in terms of the impact of global climate changes. Um, now, this is not so, this, this notion that we're concerned about global warming today is because we're worried about the fact that if the global temperature increases between two and five degrees Celsius, the world's going to change in unpredictable ways. And we don't like that, right? We don't like that because we don't know what those changes are going to be. So humans, <clears throat> justifiably, are concerned about change because it can be adverse, can adversely affect us. And in that sense, there were climatic changes actually as severe, if not more severe, than was an, is it being anticipated from global warming in the next century in the past. And so our ancestors, who were far less technologically equipped to deal with them, had in their own ways to deal with major climatic changes. And to just give a representation of that, here is the map of Africa, a very simplified map, in which it shows you the distribution of different habitats. I don't know that you probably can't read these very well, but basically you have everything from extreme desert, like the Sahara, and you have things like a tropical rainforest within the Congo, say. And in between that, you've got the grassland, savanna, scrub, semi-desert, and so forth, this gradation. And what I'm going to try to get across to you is that the environments in Africa were changing quite dramatically on a periodic basis uh, between this sort of a situation on the left, which is familiar with us today, and a drier condition during glacial conditions in which the Sahara expanded the rainforest contracted, and so forth. So you can imagine that if you live in a habitat in which you depend on to find your food and in which you are adapted to, and now that habitat starts to change, you're going to be stressed, right? Because things aren't the way they used to be. Uh, maybe the rains don't come as often as they used to. Maybe the antelope aren't as abundant, whatever. You're going to have to deal with those uh, changes. So if we look in our lineage, one of the major features in it is the enlargement of our brain. So we have here an example of Homo erectus. This is the Turkana boy, 
Uh, this is its skull. This is a, a model of it, a, a mold re reproduction. And this is the brain endocast, which means if you took the skull and you filled it in with like a putty and made an impression on the inside, okay, so you can see the outside of the skull here, and this is the outside of our skull, um, and you made an impression of the interior of that, this is what it would look like in the case of Homo erectus, and this is what it would look like in the case of Homo sapiens, that'd be us. And you can see that they are grossly morphology, morphologically similar, but of course ours is, a, is substantially larger. So the sort of overarching theme of today's lecture is going to be to try to present to you the evolution within our lineage in response to these global climate changes in Africa, uh, what was happening uh, with our members of our ancestors that then evolved in ways that led eventually to our own species, uh, Homo sapiens. Okay, so let's start by saying, asking, what do we know about our family tree, the, our lineage? This little box here was the one I showed you before. Here are gorillas, humans, bonobos, chimpanzees. These are the great apes that reside in Africa. I should also make an aside here that humans, we evolved in Africa. Now you could ask, why didn't we evolve in Asia, because you had great apes there as well, right? You had the orangutans. And in Europe, we know you had a lot of apes. But <clears throat> the general consensus is that um, we didn't evolve in Asia. Uh, our, our lineage has always been within Africa. However, as we'll see, sometimes members of our lineage moved out of Africa into Eurasia. And it's possible that there was also some backflux into Africa. But the general consensus is that most of our evolution took place on the African continent. Although in theory, uh, what I'll talk about in Africa could have happened in Asia, but didn't, or didn't last. All right, so let's look at our family tree just to orient you. This is millions of years ago here on this graph. So here's today, zero, going back six million years. And between six and seven million years ago, we have the earliest fossil evidence from Chad and um, East Africa for bipedalism, okay? Which means walking on two legs. And that's the first physical change in our lineage that occurred, is that we went from being um, ape-like in terms of moving on our knuckles knuckle walking to becoming fully habitually bipedal, walking on two legs. And we'll talk a little bit more about this just now. And so this early phase, these brown colors in here, it's a little unclear what evolved from what, these may not even be members of our lineage, direct members of our lineage. In other words, we may not have descended directly from them. We don't know that for sure. But they're the earliest fossil evidence we have for the first apes that went bipedal, walking on two legs. Then we have this green box here, which are all of what we call the Australopiths, or Australopithecines. Um, and they include the famous Lucy fossil, Afarensis. They include the uh, Sediba fossil that was recently found by Lee Berger's group in uh, the Hauteng area. And uh, Africanus, which is the twine child, which was also found in South Africa. And this group here um, all eventually went extinct, became extinct by soon after about two million years ago. But from this group, it's thought that you had a split into two other groups, one of which were the Paranthropus, uh, which are these very large jawed and they had a sagittal crest on their skull with very large chewing muscles and um, could eat very hard, tough food. And of course, our own genus group of Homo, okay? And this split occurred at about three million years ago. 
So you can see that between three and two million years ago, we had Australopithecus, Homo, and Paranthropus coexisting <coughs> in Africa. Three different major genus, genii within genera within that time period. But as I mentioned, the Australopithecus became extinct soon after about two million, and all the Paranthropus species had become extinct by about one million years ago, or a little bit after. But the one that carried on was ours, Homo. And that's shown here in blue. And it includes Homo habilis, um, Homo erectus, uh, and then branching off and to Homo neanderthalus, the Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, that'd be us, and this Floresiensis, which is the odd one that developed on the isle, island of Flores in Indonesia. So as recently as maybe 50,000 years ago, the world had perhaps one, two, three, four, maybe up to five species of Homo uh, living on Earth. Okay? But as we know, by the end of that period, um, all that remained of Homo was Homo sapiens. We're the only species that has endured up to the present day. These other species, some of which have only recently been known about, all became extinct. So <clears throat> what I want to do is just sort of guide you through this. It will be a relatively quick guide through it. I won't have time to go into all the detail. Um, but I want to give you at least an overview a uh, picture of what this evolution was about, this, this lineage, this lineage. And in theory, we should be able to trace our descent through this somewhere. But you'll see there's a lot of little question marks in here. So what exactly our line of descent was through this tree of our lineage is debated by specialists. And that's outside of my field. But I think suffice it to say that there is a uh, line of descent here. We may not even have all the ancestors that were in our line of descent as fossils yet, but I think we know enough about the cast of characters that we can say something about the process by which we evolved. And I just want to point out that this pattern where you have perhaps initially few, and then you get a, a flowering or efflorescence, if you like, of variation. As I mentioned at this time, these three different major groups were coexisting. And then at the end of the day, you end up with maybe one or two. We could have ended up with two, for example, of Neanderthals and us if we had never left Africa and Neanderthals had carried on living in Eur Eurasia. We could have had two different species of Homo indefinitely. And that's kind of what you see with the elephants. The elephants <coughs> evolved after the Cretaceous and Cretaceous uh, bolide impact that we talked about yesterday. They diversified, particularly during the Miocene. But out of all of these, we ended up with the modern day Asian and African elephant, uh, which are obviously on two major different continents and they can't exchange. So in many ways, this is a typical pattern of speciation, that you'll get certain new forms that then have a period of almost like experimentation of all these different variations. And some are successful and some aren't. Uh, some are lucky and some aren't. And you end up often with uh, some that remain. So that seemed, that's sort of a similar pattern <laughs> to what we see for, <coughs> for our lineage. OK, so. What do we first understand? Why did our lineage come about in the first place? That could be the, the starting question. And it appears that the major reason was we had a major climate and tectonic shift in Africa. So here's a picture of a tropical rainforest in Tanzania. Now imagine Africa. You know it today. It's got the Sahara. It's got the Kalahari Deserts. It's got the East African Rift Valley. Um, and it does have tropical rainforests, but those are relatively restricted to the Congo. Now imagine that you don't have an East African rift. Okay, It's relatively flat. You don't have a Kalahari desert yet. You don't have a Sahara desert yet. 
much of Africa is warmer and more humid and covered by a lot more of this sort of vegetation. And in that sort of setting, you'd want to be a monkey or an ape, okay? Because they're adapted to living in exactly that sort of environment with many trees. And in fact, the Miocene, 23, well, 20, 24 to say um, 5 million years ago, especially the early Miocene, was the heyday of the apes. Not only in Africa, but in Eurasia. Because Africa and Eurasia were more physically joined. There was no Red Sea yet, for example. Uh, Arabia Desert wasn't a desert, it was, it was forested. So apes could move back and forth, and there are an amazing record of apes in, in Europe during that time in the Miocene. That was their heyday. But what happened was partly tectonic, so you had the development of the East African Rift Valley, which caused the uplift and the essential uh, destruction of the tropical rainforest into many different environments. And you had a general drying out of the environment as temperatures got cooler. And so, as a consequence, you went from environments very typical like this to ones that would be more like a seasonal woodland, where you still have a lot of trees, but the trees are too far apart in general for the lifestyle of apes and monkeys. So, essentially, those very large areas and populations and diverse groups of apes and and, and monkeys were under pressure because this contraction of the environment that they knew changing to one that was far more open. So the idea is, um, as this transformation occurred throughout large parts of Africa, there was increasing pressure on apes to spend more time on the ground. And Spending time on the ground, it turns out that if you can go from walking on fours to two legs, uh, it's just a lot more energy efficient. And there's other ideas around um, less exposure to sun and obviously freeing up our hands. So there's a number of different ideas as to what led to it. But essentially, we went bipedal. And bipedalism isn't unique to us. But what is unique to us is this striding gait that we have. Um, after all, like ostriches are bipedal. Uh, they remember remnants of the dinosaurs. Uh, and of course, they have uh, feathered plumage instead of arms and hands. The gorillas, like the chimps, tend to do what's called knuckle walking, where they use their knuckles as they walk to help support themselves to move along. Um, so this was the big initial transformation that occurred in our lineage, is that some of the apes, <coughs> our ancestors ultimately, went to ground and evolved styles of walking that were in the end more efficient than other modes of locomotion that had existed previously. And as I mentioned in the <coughs> larger diagram, there are these fossils from Kenya and Chad which suggests that bipedalism may have been initiated seven to six million years ago. It may not have even been restricted to Africa. There might have been bipedalism developed, as I mentioned, in Eurasian apes. But the Eurasian apes never went anywhere. They all went, became extinct. And the idea is that in Africa, they didn't. They carried on evolving. And they evolved perhaps, again, it's debated, but perhaps evolved into something like this, which is a an extremely well-preserved fossil of Artipithecus ramidus, or called Arti, or short, that existed between about 5.8 and 4.4 million years ago. And here you can see that they were bipedal, but they had very odd feet. They had divergent big toes. Um, and they were clearly still very adapted to living among trees, but were also able to move around on two legs. But it's really with the advent of the Australopithecines. Here we have Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy. These are the famous bones here. This is a reconstruction by Karen Carr, an artist, of what Lucy may have looked like. <coughs> and these are the trails of tracks left by their feet. You can see, unfortunately, Lucy, the fossil, missing the feet. 
but we have foot tracks shown here that were famously made by the Australopithecines in uh, lava, uh, not lava, ash deposit that then got preserved. And from analysis of these uh, footprints, they can reconstruct that the gait, the style of walking, the stride, was very similar to modern, uh, even not exactly like us, but very much closer, certainly a lot closer than Artipithecus. So the idea is that through time, the bipedalism evolved to become more and more efficient towards what we're familiar with today. Certainly by around 3.7 million years ago, uh, you have these, uh, this evidence from Latoli. The other Australopiths, Australopithecines uh, include Sediba, which is a famous fossil uh, found here in South Africa, also quite complete. You can see how the toe, this one does have uh, some foot fossils, uh, bones. And then the trying child found by Raymond Dart, or, or analyzed by Raymond Dart. And this is a reconstruction of that child based on its uh, skull. And Sediba dates from around 2 million. So it's at the sort of other end of the Australopithecus uh, succession. You had Lucy fairly early on and Sediba near the end before the Australopithecus then finally went uh, extinct. Now, remember I said that one of the big driving forces was climate. So the idea is that bipedalism arose from changes in climate from the Miocene to much cooler conditions in the Pliocene. But that wasn't the end of it. The cooler conditions of the Pliocene continued to deteriorate into colder temperatures, more extreme temperature variations as we go to the present day. So remember I said that between three and two was a major transition in our lineage in the sense that it opened up into these different groups. You had the big jawed paranthropus, you had the homo, and you had the Australopithecine. And one idea about why that happened is that you have in this time period, shown by this blue bar, is when we have the initiation for the first time of major ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere. Now today, we have ice in the Northern Hemisphere exclusively in Greenland, okay? So there's Greenland there, not very big. But in the past, those ice sheets had grown much larger to cover much of North America and Eurasia, the northern areas. So the idea is that there was another major chemical div climate divide between about three and two and a half million years ago, where Earth's climate took a major shift to colder and drier conditions. And that was expressed for the first time in addition to having the Antarctic ice sheet, which was already pre-existing at this time, to having additional ice sheets develop in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, we today live in what's called an interglacial where almost all of this ice is melted away and only Greenland is still has ice. But you have to bear in mind that 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum. These ice sheets were in their full extent. So that's what these wiggly lines are here in red. These are showing you these transitions between northern hemisphere glaciation down here when it was colder and drier and you had large ice sheets in North America and these high points here like today when most of that ice had melted. So the point being from this red line is that you can see that the magnitude or the amplitude and the frequency of these climate fluctuations intensified during this time. And it all was initiated here during this first initial northern hemisphere glaciation, which corresponds to when Australopithecus divided up into Paranthropus and Homo. And presumably, part of the reason why that split occurred was because Paranthropus and Homo became ver variants on Australopithecus adapted to some of these changes that were occurring in Africa. And one of the big changes was you started to develop these expansive African 
savannas that we're uh, familiar with on game drives where you see these uh, very large expanses of grass area and trees and that these are seasonal. And in fact, Africa has uh, the monsoon system, the African monsoon system. Here's the one for January and here's the one for August. So we're currently in January, up country, things getting lots of rain. We're relatively dry. The opposite will be true in August. And this intertropical convergence zone shown here in red will shift to the north. Okay. And that was a very important development. It happened at this time and intensified at this time because what it meant was that instead of rainfall sort of all the time, rainfall came seasonally. And the thing about seasonal rainfall is it takes a special kind of adaptation to deal with a dry season, which can be very different from a wet season in terms of how you're going to live. So if we look at that split, here's a paranthropus. You can see the size of this jaw. And there's the sagittal crest, which supported the muscles that went down to the jawbone to chew. Uh, sometimes called nutcracker man, and that's the reconstruction there. So they were very specifically adapted to eating really hard, tough foods, particularly when times were rough, and that was the only thing they could get their hands on. The other one was Homo, that would be our lineage. Homo naledi is a good example of perhaps an early form of Homo, although we don't know the age of Homo naledi yet. But you can see the jaw is much more reasonable size. The teeth are more similar to ours. And there's a reconstruction of Homo habilis uh, at, at, around, at that, around that time. So we can speak of perhaps why we had three major groups of, in our lineage at that time coexisting is through something that we call niche partitioning, which sort of means that this one's developed for this specialization, this one for that, and so forth, and they each live in those specific settings. So for Australopithecus, they were probably still largely tied to the trees, and they probably couldn't go too far from forests. Paranthropus was also uh, developed for more open settings, but could survive, <clears throat> as I mentioned, on these much uh, more difficult, hard tubers or nuts or whatever that required uh, large, strong jaws. And then Homo's range probably was the largest and included this very open grassland setting as well as savanna. So the idea is that these three groups around two million years ago, two and a half to two million years ago, coexisted. And they probably interacted to some extent. They probably overlapped in terms of their environments that they lived in. But it was really a time period when these different uh, variants on our lineage occurred. And as I mentioned, it'll turn out that only Homo remains after about a million years ago as the Australopiths die out and so eventually do the Paranthropus and leaving us with Homo. Now the other key thing that happens at the time of Northern Hemisphere glaciation is the um, observation that you start to get tools, stone tools. So here is a picture of chimpanzee mother showing their infant how to crack a nut using a stone and an anvil. So we know that chimpanzees use quite a few tools in a number of different ways. This is just one example, use of stones. So it probably shouldn't be too surprising if we share a common ancestor that the early members of our lineage probably also used stone tools. Now for a long time it was thought that the oldest stone tools kicked in at about 2.6 million years ago called the Oldowan. And these are some examples of some Oldowan stone tools that reflect the pieces that were chipped off to use to cut hide or meat or uh, whatever. But it turns out there's a recent discovery of Lamequian stone tools that are much bigger, much, quite a bit cruder than the older one that are as early as 3.2 million. 
which is very interesting because it suggests that initially it was thought with Homo habilis handyman that stone tools were only associated with our lineage of our genus Homo. But now it's thought that it's possible, certainly possible, that Paranthropus or the Australopithecines could have also been using stone tools. But what's, what's, what we can say, whether they did use them or not, it wasn't a tradition that carried on. As I said, both of those groups went ex became extinct, and only Homo continued. And as Homo continued, there's a long-term record of stone tool use. And those stone tools evolve through time into different types of stone tools, some of which we'll mention in a minute. So although it's possible, certainly chimps today use stone tools, certainly possible that our earliest ancestors also made use of stone tools. But what's clear is in our lineage traced through the genus Homo, stone tool use was a major component of that, appears to be a major component of that lineage. And stone tools for us were very important because it allowed us to access higher caloric foods, namely meat. So at, as you go out onto the savanna and you have a lot of large animals <coughs> like this elephant that are eating uh, primary production of grass and trees, um, humans could scavenge initially without having to hunt. They could become scavengers and have access to meat as well as the marrow-rich uh, material with inside bones. Because with stone tools, they didn't have to have strong teeth. They could simply break them with a the stone tool and then access the marrow within the bone that way. Um, they had to compete, compete with other scavengers like hyenas, but if they were cooperative and worked together, the idea is they could effectively tap an incredibly uh, rich source of food from eating meat. So one of the ideas then is that as Homo evolved and started to make use of stone tools and entered into a savanna environment with lots of grazing animals, they had this access to a lot more meat. And meat and other organs from animals are distinctive in the sense that they're very high in calories especially fatty meats. And that's really important in terms of diet, and in terms of uh, diet, in terms of a source of calories. So <clears throat> the idea then is that as climate cooled and climate became more variable, stone tools became more variable from the older one into the hand axe of the Acheulean and further on through to the present day. And this could be understood in terms of a simple positive feedback loop. And that is, if you have a stable climate with abundant resources, then living is easy and there's no real need for any change. If climate is variable, so you go from abundant resources to few resources, and that could be thought of even in terms of a seasonal basis, as I mentioned, in terms of increased seasonality. Living is hard, at least for part of the year. Um, a long uh, dry season, for example, can be difficult to get through for any organism. When living is hard, you get this feedback where you attempt to get at a capacity to extract more food, whether that's with a new tool like a stone tool or behavioral change, that can then lead to more um, food calories, which can lead to a bigger, more cognitive brain, which can then lead to more innovative stone tools or behaviors, and so on. And this sort of a positive feedback loop, which is ultimately driven by these pressures to survive, um, may be one mechanism through which uh, we have the evolution of this bigger brain. So how did the brain enlarge over time? This is one plot showing you on the vertical axis the brain size in cc's, 
So a tin of Coke or beer would be down here, about the size of a chimp, actually, about 340, 350 cc's. That would be a modern day volume of a chimp's brain, which was comparable to the size of the Australopithecus and um, Paranthropus and some of the early Homo. And then through time, this shows three and a half million years ago to the present, through time, if we plot the interior volume from those endocasts, the interior volume of brain size, we can see an overall increase through this time. But there's obviously a lot of scatter, and there's a lot of problems with this sort of plot. So it's not ideal. It doesn't really tell us, ultimately, how the mean brain size increased with time. It's, not, it's a bit cruder than that. But at face value, what we can take from it is this sense that overall, it appears as if brain size increased, particularly around this time period between two and one million here, and then going on to the present day. Uh, so the idea is we can divide up our evolution into a period initially that was mostly characterized by bipedalism, walking on two legs but having a similar sized brain, not that different from, say, chimpanzees, maybe slightly larger, to a period when early Homo started with a brain size probably not that overlapped with or very similar to the other species or other uh, genera that existed, but then broke away and started to really take off uh, to a larger brain size through time. And that would be sort of the second phase of our evolution in our lineage homo uh, was this breakaway from not only being bipedal, but being bipedal with a large brain. And one of the ideas for this breakaway was that our lineage uh, was able, through stone tools, to access more of this scavenged meat, more of these calories, and that led to that positive feedback loop that allowed them to accelerate through technology, through stone tools, and perhaps behavioral, cooperative behavioral changes towards uh, a bigger brain. So this shows, again, that figure I showed you earlier with Homo erectus versus Homo sapiens. And you can see that there was a substantial increase in brain size. But body-wise, the skeleton of the Turkana boy is strikingly similar to our own. Okay? So in that sense, you know, in terms of the pelvis, the uh, legs, uh, of course, he, he also didn't have his feet preserved. But the size of his chest and so forth, um, it's really the skull that's distinctly different. But the overall uh, dimensions of the body are quite similar. So Homo erectus was really, um, and you can see that in the previous plot, Homo erectus was where we really started to have this statistically, I guess, or impression of a, of a larger brain above and beyond what existed before. So this was quite a big jump from early Homo species, like Homo habilis, to Homo erectus at this stage. And one of the ideas around how that was accomplished was through the control of fire, which would have been a huge technological advancement. Control of fire was huge because it allowed for uh, cooking of food, again, increasing the caloric value of food through cooking it, and also as a form of protection. And <clears throat> the argument I put forward in my book for how control of fire came about was probably a progressive thing. Because the thing is, when you go out into the savanna, away from the rainforest, the big thing that changes is, with that seasonality, you have far more frequent natural fires. Fire is simply a part of that environment. And <clears throat> our ancestors who occupied that would have had to have dealt with fire. It was a natural element. And <clears throat> fires can burn fairly hot, but not that hot, so that what you can get, like this poor anteater, is you can get naturally roasted food, right? Uh, we're familiar, at, here is a fire after the, uh, up on Table Mountain, the slopes of Table Mountain, 
I took this photograph about six months after the fire. You can see here are the uh, fire lilies starting to pop up. These are the corms, or bulbs, of the fire lilies, and they've been blackened and par partially roasted by the fire. And here, uh, various animals will get not completely incinerated, uh, just slightly roasted. And people probably, <clears throat> or initially, would have ventured out into these areas searching for food. And they would have naturally found ones that had been naturally roasted, seeds, nuts, some occasional animals. And they would have, if they had eaten them, they would have realized, hey, this stuff's a lot nicer. It's not as bitter. It's easier to chew. It's easier to digest. It's tastier. Um, and they would have soon associated tastier foods with fire. And in that way, would have learned to exploit those. And eventually, through the experiences with fire, as scary as that would have been initially, would have had enough um, experience to learn how to control it. Which, as I said, was huge to, to their advantage because they had to contend with all the predators like the large cats. And fire would have been enormous in terms of uh, making it far safer for them to live. Now, the problem with fire is it's very hard to preserve. Okay? So if you have a fire like these, initially, that's pretty obvious that that's burned. But it won't take long before that all gets washed away and you have uh, new green shoots and everything. So it's been very difficult to find evidence of fire, particularly controlled fire by humans. But this is a picture taken by Mike uh, Golby of the interior of Wunderwerk. Wunderwerk Cave in South Africa. I don't know if many of you have been there, but it's a very interesting site to visit. And this shows the excavation area, and you're looking from the back of the cave. That's the entrance where the light's coming through. So it's an unusually deep cave. It goes far into the rocks. And it's been known about for a long time, but only recently have people realized that there were deposits in here where there was, uh, through careful analysis, you could see that there had been a fire there. And that, was, that has been dated to one million, one million years old. A lot of people, a lot of archaeologists, would argue that fire doesn't really become a, a typical feature of human occupation sites till about 300,000 years ago. So there's a huge discrepancy. But I would argue that, the, that fire is very difficult to preserve, particularly fires that are uh, intentionally made. Uh, and because we don't have very many Wunderwerk caves of this depth. But um, if these are one million years old, then I would suggest that fire could have been uh, quite early indeed. And this is another uh, artist's impression by the same artist, Karen Carr, of a site in, in Israel, actually, that dates from about 800,000 years ago when uh, Homo erectus had moved out of Africa into the Levant. And it's based on not so, not so much evidence for fire, but evidence for organized living around what is assumed to be a fire structure. So I think the big event that was so transformative for our species with the advent of Homo erectus was this control of fire. Because the campfire, as shown here, would have formed a very early um, nest around which the human social organism could organize, right? Uh, it, because this would have been a focal point of cooperative living, basically, uh, and sharing in the raising of, of children, gathering and sharing of food for protection uh, during the night, and so forth. So I think it was a real fundamental shift in terms of our behaviors that was initiated with fire that allowed us to become the hyper-cooperative uh, species that we are. And fire was particularly important because it allowed our bodies to become less hairy, uh, which meant that our skin was exposed and we had variable skin color. We probably increase the amount of sweating and the ability to endurance run. And we develop bodies an unusually high body fat content. 
which are all characteristics of humans, of Homo, that are quite distinct, as far as we can tell, from other uh, members of our lineage. So in many respects, Homo erectus, who had arrived by around 1.9 million years ago, was very similar to us. And some would contend that you'd have a hard time telling them apart from us if they were wearing a suit and had a hat on or something, which is probably sort of true. But the big difference was, of course, that their brain was significantly smaller. Um, but otherwise, many of probably our characteristically human <coughs> behavioral and physiological features probably uh, stem in many respects from the time of the uh, evolution of Homo erectus. And Homo erectus was an extremely successful species and went throughout much of Eurasia uh, into Europe, India, and China, and to Asia uh, at that time. And partly because they had this very versatile stone tool kit. Now, Homo erectus was extremely successful, but they don't last forever. They lasted for a long time. And why did they change? And they changed in this bigger brain because a bigger brain started to matter. So what we can say is that with a directional selection for a bigger brain, one population, the old population, has a brain size distribution among individuals like that. And with time, it shifts to a bigger brain because those with a bigger brain are more likely to survive than those who don't. So these, this tail end is selected against, and these are selected for, and there's a shift in terms of the population. Now, the archaeologists debate whether this was a gradational change between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens, or whether it was a stepwise punctuated change. In many respects, as in many debates in science, I think it's probably a combination of the two, and there's certainly evidence for both being operative. But at any rate, through time, those changes occurred. And as I mentioned at the beginning, they probably were driven largely by these large climatic cycles. And what was most significant was about 900,000 years ago is when we had our first major glacial period shown here by this sharp drop in the sea level and in global temperatures. And ever since then, about nine, from 900,000 years ago, we've had this cycle of warmer, colder, warmer, colder, over and over again. And our ancestors had to adapt to that continual climatic change, uh, and in response to that, evolved. 